welcome to my talk, Implementing Binary Protocols with Elixir. Um, I hope you're curious um, about this. I got curious about binary protocols like um, a year and a half ago, um, but we'll talk about this in a second. Um, I'm pretty stoked to be here. Uh, as you might guess, coming over from Germany is quite a trip. It's not my first time here, though. I've been here 26 years ago. You can judge by my awesome like, clothes. <laughs> Um, but anyway, to, in order to, to start the talk and to make it a real story, well, we have to take a little detour. Um, and then we'll, like, it, it might take uh, the first 10 minutes of the talk, and then we are coming to the, you know, to the beef. But let me talk about the web first. I myself, I'm a web developer since I started developing software. And what I felt is that the web is screwed, right? Um, since the beginning, it's, you felt this even more and more. So I think it's because it's completely outgrown its intent, right? Sir Tim Berners-Lee imagined the web like 25 years ago with the idea that research institutes can share their results and in a document way. His idea was even that the web browser is kind of an editor. All this stuff did not happen. Um, now we have Tinder. Uh, <laughs> he might not have think of that. It's slow, right, because of multiple reasons. And if you take a look at an average website two years ago, it had 101 assets, which all over had 2.6 megabytes, shared over 38 connections. And especially the connections um, made this website slow, because um, you have it's TCP, uh, uh, the other way around. T HTTP is running over TCP, and on TCP, you have this um, handshake process, which is a uh, ping back and forth at least three times. And if you're using an encrypted connection, it's even more. The inventors and the people in charge of the protocol, namely the IEFT, um, knew about this a long ago, like almost 10 years now. And like three years ago, they started working on fixing it. So they invented, or they came up with the idea of the next version of the HTTP protocol, namely HTTP2. So first of all, let me tell you a little bit about HTTP2. Um, it's compatible, so it's completely not breaking the web. The scheme will stay, so we'll never, the user will never see an HTTP2 somewhere in the URL or some, something. All the semantics we have. Um, headers, methods, and the request response cycle that will stay. And here's the thing, how they fix the connection problem. They multiplex single TCP connections. So you can transfer multiple resources over the same given TCP connection. You can think about this um, like that. So you have one physical TCP connection, and then on this connection there are logical streams, and on this connection, there are frames. So each frame belongs to a logical stream. Technically, it's only frames being sent over. And now I want to talk about these frames. And these frames are binary. So here you see the connection um, where, where we're going now. So these frames in the H2 protocol are binary frames. And they're binary for a good reason, because they want to save, sp um, save some space on the connection. And they want to make it fast. So the idea of the HTTP2 protocol was to be really, really fast. And here we have an example of, the, of a typical frame layout. So every um, binary protocol usually follows um, frame layout. Here you see the one from HTTP2. It starts um, with a length. Um, every frame layout or every binary data usually um, have the length in there, because you should know where you should stop parsing. Um, especially if it's a protocol, like a network protocol. Um, it might be not the same for uh, files on the disk. They have a type. Um, we have flags in here. Uh, the type defines the set of flags. Then there's the so-called reserve bit. It's always zero, so you should not bother with that. It's <laughs> just zero. And the stream identifier. This is what I just talked about, that the frames belong to a logical, to a logical thing. Um, also, frame layouts are always in this 8-bit chunk, so in the binary chunk. And this is just the header, so there's also the body following. There are 10 different frame types, and I want to take a look at one specific one, 
which is the header. So you all probably know HTTP headers, right? It's metadata information per request. And it has the type one because it usually initiates a request. And this is the frame layout of the header frame. You only see the body here. So there's also on top of that, there's the header frame format or layout you saw on the previous slides. Again, it has a pad length, so this specifies the length of the padding so that every parser could know what is the header block fragment, what is the padding. The padding is a security mechanism. It's um, against attacks called breach and crime. I'm not that much into security stuff, so this is all I really want to tell you about that. Um, so if you're, if you're curious about that, just Google breach and crime. And um, then there's also the exclusive bit, the stream dependency await. Um, that's not our main focus here. You could fill up a complete other talk about that. And then there's the header block fragment. And here we're going even, even closer to binary protocols, because not only the HTTP protocol is binary, the HPAC, or the header block fragment, is also a binary protocol. So if we fill up this with like real fake data, I'd say, um, <laughs> this is. Uh, this is a frame, and this is, should be valid, at least judging from uh, the implementation I have. Um, and I want to talk about this block here. So this is the so-called header block fragment, and all headers transferred on the protocol are encoded like that. Now, I want a little bit talk about my motivation on this talk. So I fumbled around with the HP2 protocol for quite some time. I found it pretty interesting. It solves a lot of problems we have nowadays. Um, it solves kind of the, it kind of the same, it kind of solves the same problems all the weird asset pipelines are trying to solve, but on the right layer. And um, I got interested in that, so I was tinkering around with the protocols, and I stumbled upon, uh, upon the HPAC um, RFC. So the HPAC RFC, is the RC where the whole header block fragment parsing is described. And it's, it is decoupled from the RFC where HV2 is described for the same reason you would decouple in software, right? So you can update independently. And it could be used in other places. So if you ever have the use case of having headers and you want to compress them and you're not running on the HTTP protocol, you could also reference to that. But there are a few, um, there are a few points. They really point to the direction that it's used in HTTP, and at the moment it is the only use case, um, but it's not really tied, closely tied to that. Right? And also, I might or might not write my own web server in Elixir, um, but it's definitely not something uh, we are here to talk about. <laughs> well, how does HPEG work? HPEG works with a so-called header, compres header compression table. So this is to give you some context um, about the Elixir code we will see in a minute. So, Again, the HPEG protocol works with a header compression table. And this is the header compression table. It consists of two parts. There's a static part and dynamic part. But it is one table. So the index continues to, to run, right? And if I have a given header, like the method get here, the encoded version will look like this. So you could encode the header method get just by an index in the header, um, in the header compression table. Same for uh, the method uh, for the scheme. And the host is also encoded um, differently here. And then there's the pass, for example. And if there's a value which is not in the static or dynamic table, you just encode the string um, with Huffman encoding. I won't talk about Huffman encoding in this talk. Um, but it's, I think it's an interesting encoding. And if you want to know more about this, um, just Check it out. It's not, I mean, you could learn it in like half a day or a few hours. Um, there's an awesome YouTube video explaining it. Um, I have linked at the end of my slides. Uh, I will upload them later. So I can really recommend checking them out. And it's in, it is encoded like that because you can think that the method get is something you would see on, on the whole internet quite a lot, right? This is probably the most sent header or the most sent thing. Um, ever, right? Because it's retrieving information from any web page. And this is why you can have the key and the value in the header compression table. And then there might be headers 
where the header is like always in every request, like path, right? There's always a path and request. But you can't have, or mostly, the value differs. And this is why you have it um, decoupled here. And you can have entries in the header compression table where only the key is specified and the value could be dynamic. As I mentioned, it's a binary protocol as well. So it also has this binary format. And I want to look at this now. So this is uh, an index header. Think of method get. And I really, want to, um, I really want you to pay attention to the first bits in the first line um, when we are taking a look at all the different formats now, um, because they all follow the same scheme. So if you're receiving an index header, the first bit would set to 1, and then there's the index um, the header is actually referring to. Then there are literal header fields with incremental indexing. That means that the headers are added to the dynamic table. And these start um, with a 0 in the first bit, a 1 in the, in the second bit, so with the index 1. And then there's the index if it's an index name, or a 0 if it's not an index name. Same for little header fields without index. Um, but again, the first bits differ, right? So the first bits are four zeros, and then the index, or everything zero if it's a new name. And then there's also never indexed, um, which is for intermediaries on the protocol. Um, then it's three zeros, one, then the index, or a zero. So you see every possible format, every possible um, direction on how to handle a header has a different um, different signature, right? And this is how you can determine which header block fragment or which header you're actually seeing. And this is what we're going to do now. Um, I really want to guide you through this library I wrote on how to parse the HPEG protocol. So now that we have the context set, um, let's take a look at decoding the, the header block fragment. Before we do that, there's one um, basic which is, which is super crucial. Um, and I really want to take this short digression. It's binaries and strings. And basically, binaries are strings. Uh, ban uh, a string in Elixir is a UTF-8 encoded binary. Um, I was just checking the schedule of this conference this morning. And I saw that there's an entire talk about this. Um, so if you want to know more, uh, check out that talk. Um, we just do this really quick here. but. I think with that statement, um, there's enough content covered um, to make my point in the next slide. So if we switch over to the console and just firing up IEX, um, you could see um, with the helper method uh, question mark each code point of every character you have. So if I do a question mark E, I can see that E has a code point 101. You can also do it the other way around. You can specify a string by writing a binary. So this is a binary construct. And if I just write 108 and add the UDF8 modifier, and modifiers are usually more for pattern matching, um, you will see I get the string out. So Elixir always, and IEX, always displays you a string, even though it is a binary, when every binary or every code point in this binary has a re representation in the, in the table. Um, you can also just leave out um, the modifier, as you see here. So it's still an L. Um, because the code point is something displayable. And if we clear up this terminal now, just fill up the string Jose. And there's another trick. If you want to see each code point of, the, of a string, just append a non-displayable character, the 0, for example. And then you would see each code point in here. And this obviously also works for uh, emojis and whatever. Well, switch back. Um, now let's take a look at the actual HPEG module. So all the code you're OK. Is it me? OK. I better stand here. So all the code you're going to see now is inside this HPEG module. There's also two supporting modules um, we're not taking a look at. This is the table implementation and the Hoffman implementation. But uh, we'll see this in a second. So the HPEG module defines its own type because we are dealing with headers a lot. So we're defining our header type. And a header is just a tuple of two strings. It's key and value. So method get would be two strings, methods, and get. There's the public function decode. So we're going to take a look on how decoding works. right? Um, it's a parity of two. This is important uh, later on. 
and its signature is that you receive the header block fragment, which is a string or a binary, which is the same, and the PID of the table. So the table is a gen server implementation. It's just a gen server um, holding up the state of the dynamic and the static table. Um, and again, I don't have the implementation of that, but all the code is on GitHub, so if you want to see how the table and the Huffman stuff works, just check it out. Well, um, now let's come to the interesting part. How does the code work? Well, it's parsed. <laughs> uh, well, no. So we're going to see how parse works. Um, due to the fact that a header block fragment can hold multiple headers, and we're going to call parse recursively, and this is why we are calling parse with an empty list, because we are going to add the headers we are just parsing to the list. Let's get back to this image. Um, as I said, this is a valid header block fragment, and I want to pass this header block fragment together with you um, in the following slides. So pay attention to the first few bytes, right? So it's one, a bunch of zeros, and then a one zero, which should be a two, right? And then there's some other stuff. So if you're calling um, the path method um, with the header block fragment, and I have multiple um, implementations of the path method, this is one which is going to match. And if you take away something from this talk, and if you came here to know how binary protocol parsing works, this is really what I want you to take away, because this is basically all it takes. And we're using a few Elixir patterns here, and the first one is you can deconstruct um, binaries in function headers and then use function header pattern matching. Right? So I just paste the complete binary as a first argument, and then I'm deconstructing the binary and pattern match against the pattern I know from the protocol. And this is why I have the code comment above, right? This is how, how the library came to life, because I just pasted the, the, the formats into my library, and then I'm writing the function headers. And the implementation is not, I mean, you'll see this in a second, but it's not that complex. Um, take, take care that the rest variable we have here already is without the first one, because we pattern matched out the one. Right. And then there's the empty list and the pit. So next thing we have to do is we are passing out the integer, so the index, which is an int seven, the multiple representation of integers we'll see in a second. Um, for now, let's just, let's just take this as given that parse int seven gives you with the index. And then you just do a lookup in the table to see what is the actual header. And as I mentioned, it's a two. And regarding to the, um, had a, had a block table or the HPAC table, the index two refers to method get. So we know the first header. What we do is then we pass again the rest and then append the header to the list or prepend the header to the list and then calling parse again. So up next, um, it's the same. It's again the same header, um, the same function which is matching, so we're going over this a bit faster here, right? You see the header um, we just passed out is in the variable now. Um, this time it's index six, and six is scheme HTTP, and then we are calling parse again. Again, it's the same thing, matching, so it's again uh, the index header field. You see the headers have now both headers in the list, in the like, inverse order. So this time is uh, with the index four. So you see there could be path um, variations which are in the table, like slash here. So if you look up the header, you get this one. Again, append it, and then we're calling parse again. And now something different is going to happen because it's not an index header field. So what we have now is a literal header field with incremental indexing. So this means there's only the index known, but the value is a string. And again, we're doing the deconstructing panel matching here. Um, the rest is also a bit uh, less. There's one thing uh, you might wonder, um, which is the modifier, which is just an integer. It's the shorthand. It's basically syntax struggle for having the size modifier. So when you see uh, zero colon colon one, it is basically zero colon colon size one. Um, so that's, yeah, that's basically it. And you can even combine modifiers um, with adding a dash or minus. So what, what do we do now? Um, this time the, index, the integer is encoded um, in six bits or in six plus bits, uh, passing that one out. Then we're passing the string. And what we're doing, um, we're passing the complete 
block, so the um, two lines at the bottom, we are passing that to the parse string method because strings are always encoded like that. So the format of the strings is always that format. And then we are, um, then we are taking, uh, we are looking up the header from the table because we only have an index, so we have to know the actual header string, right? So we have to know the key. That's authority. And due to the fact that it's um, incremental indexing, we have to add the header to the list because next time someone wants to send us the header, it could actually reference just to the index, right? And the index and what is in the table and what's not in the table is actually not something which is transferred between client and server. So if I'm the client, you're the server, I'm sending you something and I say, you save it, I know you will get ID 52 because the static table, if it's the first thing I'm sending you, um, because I know that the static table is just until 51, and the next thing I send you and say save, I know it's 52. So I know what you have in your table. Um, this is how this works. Well, and then again, we are calling parse, um, adding prepending the header we just parsed, and then calling it. Now something, again, different is happening. Um, this is how we terminate um, recursive function calls, right? So now the header block fragment is empty. We've passed everything. So we have to kind of wrap up. So we just reverse the header list because the headers have to stay in the order that's mentioned in the RFC. So we're just reversing it, and then that's it. We have passed the headers. This is how header block fragments um, get parsed. No. Never played around with that. You mean no speed differences? Yeah, it, it, it's probably nominal for this kind of thing. I yeah, I mean, you won't send that much headers, right? I think the header list is, if it's, if it's 100 headers, it's immense. And 100 is maybe not that big of a difference. OK, um, let's wrap up how header parsing works and how this header block fragment we have just parsed, um, how it looked like. So the first byte was the method get header. The next one was scheme HTTP. The next byte was path slash. And the next byte was just the key authority. And then all the rest was the string www.example.com. So if you want to use your headers efficiently, this is another takeaway from this talk, hopefully, um, always use index headers as much as you could. And if you can't do that, always add them to the table. But usually, this should only be an interest if you're writing a web server or something. Because on the otherwise, um, the clients and stuff should handle that for you, right? But maybe, I don't know, don't have headers which change all the time when it's not necessary. That could be a takeaway for, you know, usual web consumers. Okay, then there's uh, two things left while decoding, which is parse string and parse integer, right? So let's take a look at how string parsing works, because I want to save the most complicated one for the, for the later. Um, string parsing is this. So you have um, this format, and as I mentioned, it's always the same. And the first bit indicates whether the string is Hoffman encoded or not. So it's one or zero. And then there's the actual length, and then there's a the string. So how does this work here? Uh, we have the rest. First thing we do is we pile out the length, and this, using, this is using the same integer, um, the same integer encoding. Uh, we'll see that in a second. And then we do a pattern match again. And you don't have to have this pattern matching in the function header. You can just do this pattern matching as you would do pattern match like in all your other Elixir code. So we are pattern matching out um, the actual string value and the rest because you, know, you never know how much there's left. And while we are at this slide, I want to talk very briefly about the binary and the bit string um, modifiers. So the binary modifier basically says it, how it always has to be a complete byte. Right? So it's always a multiplier of 8. Um, the size always have to be multiplier of 8. Otherwise, it's, um, it's a match error. Right? And bit string is basically, it don't have to be a complete byte. So it could be just you know, um, 7 bits. That, that is OK for bit string, but that's not OK for binary. Um, that's the difference on that. OK, and then we have parsed out basically everything, and then we're returning, we, we, we are returning the string value and the rest. Oh, yeah, and this is how Huffman encoding looks. So it's basically the same code. It's basically completely the same code, unless um, the function header is different. So again, I've defined parse string two times. First time, um, the function header says 0. Second time, function header says 1 in the first bit. 
and then the, before we return the string value, we actually call Hoffman decode. Again, if you're interested in how, in how, in how Hoffman decoding works, um, you can check out the library on GitHub. If you know Hoffman decoding and are wondering about the um, table, the decoding table, the decoding table is specified in the protocol. So this is something you don't have to transfer. It's, it's given. Yeah? So if you check out the library, you will see, like, I think it's a 200, yeah, it's a 250, 250 lines of you know, just table definition. <coughs> All right, now let's come to the, I think, most complicated part, um, how integers are encoded. So let's recall, this is how uh, the format looks like um, for the index header field. And for the index header field, the index or the size you have to transfer the index is seven bits. And seven bits is, is, quite, is, is quite good, so you can encode um, quite big numbers in there. So for this example, it might work. But in the protocol, you can also find integers encoded in four bits. And this could be not enough if you want to say, here's my string um, www.mysuperlongurl.com. Uh, this might not be enough to encode this in four bits, right? So this is why it is 7 plus or 4 plus, because it basically says the integer you're going to pass now is 7 or 7 plus unlimited, however much space it needed. So it's basically um, unlimited um, integer size. And I wanted to talk about how this works now. Um, here is a little CS 101. How you, how you know um, which decimal is encoded in a binary? Well, you assign the values 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 46, and so on to the values, and only set the ones um, with a bit of set starting on the right side. And then you just do a sum, and you know this binary would be 42. Right, but we have computers. They do this stuff pretty well. Um, just to get a little recap here. So 42 is a quite a small number, so encoding this um, just works. And this is how it would work in the given header block fragment, right? Uh, you would just encode the number at 7, and that's fair. But what if we have a bigger number? Well, the bigger number um, follows the following pattern. First thing you do, if the number does not fit into the string or into the space you have given, in our example, it's 5. So think of in 5 plus, right? You set all bits to 1. And this indicates the parser that the integer is bigger than the given prefix. So here in our example, it's a prefix of 31. And then we have a rest of 1,306. So 1,306 um, is still bigger 128, where 128 is what we could encode in this um, complete 8 byte, or in, uh, in this complete byte, right? So we have to encode um, this by doing a modulo or dividing it. So we're dividing 1,306 by 128. And what's, sorry, <laughs> what is important, important for the parser is that you always set the most important, the most significant bit, which is the bit on the very left in our example, has to be set to 1 so the parser knows the next line is also important for the integer. Because when the next line is 0, it knows the binary ends here. So what we're doing now, um, we have the rest, which is uh, a 10. And then we're encoding the 10. The 10 easily fits in 128. And then we encode the 10. And this is done. I think this is very complex. It took me a long, to, long time to wrap my head around this. I really want to give a huge shout out to the Cowboy implementation of this stuff, um, because the Elixir implementation I have is pretty much inspired or maybe copied by that. Um, so how does this work? Well, this is um, parsint 4, as I mentioned. And here's a pattern match when we are decoding. Um, and all the first bits in this rest we got passed is 1. We know that we have to call parse begin with the rest. And then we also give the prefix size, because we have parsint 4, parsint 6, parsint 7. And then we have kind of the fetch all. So if the first one doesn't match, this one will match. And uh, we know it is um, smaller than the one we just mentioned. So we can just return it, right? Pass it out and then return it. And then we have parse begin. And what parse begin does, it basically has the first the match where it's a zero at the most significant bit. So we know that we can stop parsing here. 
So what we do is um, we parse out the rest, um, and then we have the value. And then we do some bit shifting magic here, and then it's set. And the same is if the most, the most significant bit is a 1, we know we have to call parse big n again. All right. Now let's talk about encoding. And um, to make my job here easy, I could say encoding is just decoding, but reverse. Uh, <laughs> it basically is, but I want to I wanna walk us through um, this with a little bit more examples here. So we have public, the public function encode. It gets past a list, so we, that's why you see the guard function here, because we want to make sure it's always a list of headers and never just one header. And then we would just um, do the encoding and call encoding with a parity of three. Um, because it's, again, a recursive call, and we have the header block fragment here. And the header block fragment for the starting call is obviously an empty binary. And then, uh, as you just see, we have the private function encode to encode the headers. And this um, does a case on the table, because we could have three different states. And the first one is that the key and the value are known to the table, like method get. right? So that's the key and the value are in the table. So we know we could just encode the index header. It could be a key match so that the key is in there, like an authority example, right? So the authority is in there, but the value should be encoded uh, literally. And then there's a non-match, basically, so the value is not in the table at all. The HPAC library I wrote only have uh, the three cases implemented. So there's not the never index stuff um, that's not going to happen. And uh, the not added to the table um, is also not here. So um, we call um, either one of the methods depending on um, how we um, want to encode the header. And then we have the partial header. And then we just um, append this to the header block fragment. And uh, we have everything encoded. Well, now let's take a look at how this encoding works, because this is where the magic happens, right? And this is encoded next. And I think, I don't know, I think this is pretty straightforward, right? So we just said, again, regarding to the form at the first bit to one, and then you encode the, then you encode the integer in, in seven. So up next, uh, there's a little header field with incremental indexing. So first thing we do, if we look up uh, what kind of header we have, because we want the, um, we want the header to be um, added, right? So we add it to the table. And then we just encode the header. So we set, uh, the, uh, we set the scheme, basically. So the first bit is 0, the second is 1. Then we have the index. And then we do encode string as a binary. And now also, let's take a look at how these primitives are encoded. So let's start with strings. There's encode string. And in the HPEG library, again, there's only the case where strings are half-bit encoded. Um, so the, there's never the case, in this library at, at least, where a string is not half been encoded, because I think it's OK to always do it. I mean, there could be the downside of like speed, because it uses a few more CPU cycles than the other one. I don't know if that's important. Um, but regarding to size, there's, either it's equal if the string is kind of short, the size would be equal. And if the string is longer and has more repeating characters, the string will be shorter. So I think it's, it's good to always do that, at least for the start. And then um, how integers are encoded, well, this is the same kind of bit shifting magic. So let's take a look at encode in 6. Um, if, it's, if the int is um, smaller, we plainly encode it. right? It's not, if it's not, we encode the big int. And again, set, uh, the, we pass the prefix, or set the prefix in the binary here. right? And then there's encode big int. And if it's like smaller, then 128, which is whatever could fit in the one bit. And we're just encoding it, setting the most insignificant bit to a 0. Or we call encode big int again. Awesome. If you've read the abstract um, and the talk description, I also promised to talk a little bit about um, RFC-based tests. And I think RFC-based tests sounds like you could follow up a complete talk. Um, it's not. But yeah, let's take a look. So this is the test um, I have, or the test setup. Um, it obviously uses x unit. And for setup, we just set up a table. So here you see the first time a little bit of table code, at least how it's initialized. 
And here is a screenshot of the actual RFC. So this is the IFT spec. And I want to zoom in a little bit. And they have really sophisticated examples of how the protocol is functioning. So they have um, always the encoded header list, uh, the, the non encoded header list, like the pain header list. Then they have a hex dump of the encoded data. And then they have um, an example of how the decoding process works and then um, how the dynamic table look afterwards. And they don't have this for one header block fragment. They even have this for subsequent requests. So they have the first request looks like this. And then we make this request. And then the table looks like this. Encoding looks like this. So I think this is really, this is really awesome. And if, you just, uh, if you're implementing this library um, like I did, um, I was just copying over the test. Because if I have the tests they have in the specs passing, I can be super sure that my implementation is correct, right? Because they have such good tests. And here you see one of this um, RFC tests. Uh, I really shortened lots of stuff here. Um, but this is basically how it works. So this is the test for the little header field uh, with indexing. First thing I did is setting up the header block fragment mentioned in the test. But as you can see, it looks a little bit different than the one in the actual spec, right? Because they have this hex dump and it looked, yeah, it looked different. So what I did was just pasting it in. And then I was going with a lot of multi-line edit and search and replay stuff splitting up the four digits blocks to two digit blocks, then prepending a zero x, and then copy out the comments. OK, so this is uh, what the test does. So it actually passes the header block fragment and the table um, to the HPEC decode function. And then it asserts if the header I just received actually is this what is specified in the test. And I also um, check the table size, because this is also something the specs provide. The specs also provide the expected table size. But if you think on the, or if you remember how the, um, how the spec looked like, I think it would be awesome if my tests could just look like that, right? So what I really would want to have, and there is a, there is a change that in the actual code, um, you can see where this happened, um, I want to have uh, that one just in the code, right? So I wanted to have uh, this representation of the hex dump in my test uh, and not like transforming it manually all the time. But if you look at this code, it's not valid Elixir code, right? It's not, it's not going to work. So um, what we could do at this, at this point, we can just come up with our custom signal here to make this work. And this is a test helper. And as you can see, the lines in there are kind of long. Um, I want to walk really quick through this. Um, basically, what we do here is we split line by line, then we remove the comments, and then we split by space into two byte chunks, then we flatten and fill out the junk, and then we convert the hacks into actual integers. I am sure that this is not the optimal solution. I am sure that this works. Um, so if you have improvements to that, again, it's on GitHub, so just feel free to jump on that and improve that. If we jump now into the terminal, execute the RC tasks. Um, you see, even though it's a lot of helper tests, a lot of helper code, Elixir is as awesome that this works really fast. And it doesn't slow down the test at all. Again, the code is all open source in GitHub. So if you're interested in that, if you want to poke around this, if you, I don't know, want to work with this a little bit, if you want to improve it, just jump on that, um, send some pull requests. I mean, there's not, it's not the biggest open source library in the world, right? It's really this. Basically, there's nothing going on, to be honest. There's one pull request. There's one guy. And I really appreciate that, because he's writing an HTTP client, and he found a bug. And I don't know if he found a bug in Nginx or if he found a bug in my code. Um, and we're actually in the moment of figuring this out. So if you want to read really long pull request text, uh, if you're also invited. Um, this is a thing I might or might not write. Uh, if you're interested in how web server code could look like, um, also I want to invite you to come to me and talk. I really want to give you some final thought about all the stuff I did and all the stuff I was doing. Um, I think Elixir is, and also Erlang as well. So this is kind of like Elixir and Erlang could be replaced one by one here in this case, in this example. And as you will see, as, as we have Cowboy, right? Cowboy is awesome, and Cowboy has a lot of this stuff. You can also do this stuff in Cowboy. Um, but Elixir is really great to do that. And we got a lot of syntactical sugar over the stuff we could do with Erlang. And I think parsing out this stuff is pretty awesome with the function, uh, with the pattern matching and the function header matching. Even though um, time is running out, I really want to take this um, five seconds of uh, fireworks to my uh, for my company, Jimnu, and because they basically enabled me being here, so they basically enabled you listening to this stuff I did here. 
And um, yeah, if you want to chat about um, how Website Builder works or, I don't know, uh, how working in the most beautiful city in Germany is, uh, just drop by. Uh, my name is Ole Michaelis. If you got any feedback to my talk, to the stuff I do, I do not, or I mentioned or I did not mention, um, please just follow up on Twitter. Uh, that's the thing. I do the best. I do the most. Um, I don't have business cards. I don't know why people still have this that tree in their pockets. Um, Twitter is some business cards, so if you want to do that, uh, just follow me. There's follow on GitHub, so if you're into that, you can follow me on GitHub. No one does that. Um, I'll check out my homepage, my side project. I don't know. This is really all I got, and I want to thank you very much for listening to me.